I think um, I'm going to get things started here. Uh, I'm Mike McElhatton with the Anza Borrego Desert Natural History Association in Borrego Springs. And the nice picture that you see behind me is my backyard. I took that photo earlier today. I know we have people all over the place who participate in our webinars. We have some people from Sitka, Alaska, and your backyard probably doesn't look like this. And, but I know you have, a, you, you have a tie in one way or another to Borrego Springs, so at least you get to see what it looks like. Um, our webinars this year have been have been really popular. Um, starting in December, or I'm sorry, starting in January, we're going to start to offer um, hybrid programs where we will be going back to in-person lectures in our library, and uh, and and we hope that all of those will also be um, offered as webinars. Now, most of our webinars are free. We do have a couple of things that uh, are fundraisers that are coming up, but uh, they have been free this season and last season as well. But you know, I want to encourage you if you if you like what you see, if you're interested in our programs, that I'd encourage you to make a donation. Go back to the same page where you uh, registered for this, and uh, and you can do that there. Okay, so turning to tonight's program, um, I, I've been arranging programs at Abna for about 11 years. I just thought about this, and we have had a lot of programs in Abna about geology. But as I was um, talking with Jeffrey here just before we get started, you know, uh, geology only goes so deep. It doesn't go down too much to look at things like the Earth's core, and um, and it doesn't really get into um, uh, electromagnetic uh, aspects of of our existence here on Earth. And that's really what we're going to be taking a look at um, tonight uh, in in many of those um, things. Uh, our speaker tonight is Jeffrey Love. He's a research geophysicist. Uh, in the geomagnetism program of the U.S. Geologic Survey in Colorado. He, um, he uh, ha has a PhD uh, from Harvard in geophysics. And his work now, he says in these days, is analyzing data. So uh, data is coming in on uh, uh, geoelectric hazards and things like this and uh, extreme in extremely intense magnetic storms and records of past historical events and all that kind of stuff. And his job is to make sense of it. And, uh, and put it in some perspective. I won't say too much about it because he's gonna be talking about that very thing. Uh, when we first talked about this program, um, he said that he would like to do this over two sessions. And so that's what we have planned. This is the first session tonight. And uh, the next session will be uh, tomorrow night starting at the exact same time. So with that, Jeffrey, I'm going to fade out of sight and turn off my okay. microphone and turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to um, get things rolling here. Um, I think I think you folks can see my screen. <clears throat> um, hey, Mike, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, it's really my pleasure to give this presentation today. Um, and, you know, I'm very happy to to present to people who are interested in learning the general public. Um, that's great. And, uh, you know, I just want to encourage people's curiosity. And I hope that this sparks a little bit of that curiosity. Um, Mike mentioned some of this work that I do um, and analyzing data and magnetic storms and hazards and things. And that actually is gonna be the subject of my second presentation. Um, and you could say that the second presentation is about the external part of the Earth's magnetic field. Whereas what I'm gonna to talk, to you about, to talk to you today about is is the in internal part of the Earth's magnetic field. It's a subject that I used to work on. Um, so I have some um, knowledge on this subject as well, and I'm happy to talk to you about it. So anyway, um, our magnetic planets show here a, a kind of schematic of our Earth um, showing, showing kind of the interior of the Earth as well as the Earth's magnetic field in, in terms of this kind of you know, schematic cartoon. The Earth's magnetic field originates in the core of the Earth, where we have what amounts to a naturally occurring electric generator. There are electric currents there. Those generate magnetic fields, and the magnetic fields extend um, beyond where the currents are in the core of the Earth. They extend up to the surface of the Earth, where we can measure them, and they extend out into space, where the extent of the Earth's magnetic field is something known as the magnetosphere, and that's going to be the subject part of that's going to be the subject for tomorrow's presentation. So anyway, that is kind of a, a very brief overview of some of the issues here. And I've been already dropping a few kind of semi-technical terms, currents, magnetic fields, 
I'm going to keep talking about those throughout this presentation. And I'm going to be a little bit redundant um, in discussing them just to, because I understand how learning is, that sometimes it helps to explain things a few, few times in different ways. And um, I hope that that's okay. Um, and if you uh, don't understand everything I talk about today, I think that's okay. Um, but I hope you uh, can learn something and, like I say, car carry that curiosity going forward. So, okay, with that, our magnetic planet. And I am going to first talk um, a little bit about electromagnetism, the physics. It's a subject of physics, not geophysics, um, but a subject of physics. And again, just talking about some terms, I want to get some words kind of associated with other words and um, explain some uh, very general concepts which are important in the subject of, of electromagnetism. So uh, uh, four different kinds of principles here that I want to explain. The first one is, is, is a, an association of magnetic fields and electric currents. When you have electric currents, you have magnetic fields. Um, and that is a very simple kind of association. You might say that the, a magnetic field in some respect is equivalent to a, a current. You know, when you have a magnetic field, you have a current somewhere and vice versa. That's uh, a law known as Ampere's law uh, developed by um, Andre Marie Ampere, a French scientist in the um, 18th and uh, early 19th century. So magnetic field gives you currents and currents means you have in a magnetic field. Um, the second law is Michael Faraday's law. This is an, a little interesting twist on things now. When you have a time dependent or a changing magnetic field, you can induce or generate electric fields. And that is the principle of the electric generator and the electric motor. Um, so in both of those situations, you have changing magnetic fields and they induce currents or the currents are used to um, couple with the magnetic field to exert a force in the form of a motor. So that is Michael Faraday's law. Third law is, is Ohm's law, which is actually more important for tomorrow's presentation. But in a conductor, an electrical conductor, like a piece of metal, um, you have a current, a, a flow of electric charges, and that that current, its strength is proportional to the electric field. And that proportionality factor is the electrical conductivity. And then finally, we have Lorentz's law, which, mean, which is that moving electric charges, um, such as electrons, um, experience a force that is transmitted by a magnetic field. And so, in fact, sometimes you hear the term a magnetic force field, so that there's, that's not an accident. The magnetic field actually exerts a force on electric charges. Okay, that's a very brief summary. Um, if you ha haven't taken all that in, that's okay, because I'm going to um, kind of politely remind you of some of the concepts as we go through with this presentation. So let me see, I'm having a little bit of trouble advancing here. There we go. So a couple of basic questions. What is a magnet and what is a compass. So I think uh, most of you know that when you have an atom, you have a um, atomic nucleus made of positive charges, and you have a cloud of electrons that orbit around that atomic nucleus. Now, in some atoms, the motion of the electrons around the nucleus is organized. And when it's organized, you can think of those electrons as forming a tiny electric current. And by Ampere's law, when you have an electric current, you have a magnetic field. All right, so some materials have irregular arrangements of atoms and others have regular arrangements of atoms. And if these are atoms that happen to have those electric currents, because the electrons are organizing themselves, if those atoms are organized, then you have a net magnetization to the material that you have, and you call that a magnet. So that's that thing on the top right there. I think you can see my cursor right there in the top right. If on the other hand, the atoms in the material, same material, but if those atoms are disorganized, then the tiny little magnetic fields that each one of the atoms is generating do not add together, and you would say that that material is not magnetized. So a magnet is a material 
of ferro, it, it's a ferromagnetic material. That means it's iron-like because iron atoms have this property of organized currents in their um, atomic electrons. Um, it's a material with atoms that have an organized, an organization of electron orbits. The magnetic fields generated by these orbits um, orbiting electrons together give the material a magnetization. So that's a, a magnet. A compass is a device, very simple device used by, for navigation for centuries um, with a magnetized needle. So it's a tiny, tiny magnet that's allowed to rotate on the tip of a pin and, and it rotates and aligns itself with the ambient magnetic field. So the earth has a magnetic field and a compass needle aligns itself with the orientation of the magnetic field at the location of that compass. Now, since the earth has a magnetic field, a compass is useful for orientation and navigation across the surface of the earth. That's a subject I'm gonna talk a little bit about. And, that, and so in that sense, this is um, one of the oldest uh, nautical instruments that um, uh, humankind has had. A uh, couple things about the compass. Usually you think of the compass um, in the horizontal plane. You think of the needle as being able to or orient itself in the horizontal plane. If, however, you were to take the compass and tilt it on its, on its side, you could measure the inclination of the Earth's magnetic field. That is the, the dip of the uh, magnetic vector. Um, and furthermore, if you wanted to measure the strength of the magnetic field, what you could do is take your compass and measure how hard it is to pull the needle off of its preferred orientation. That restoring force would be um, proportional to the strength, again, of the magnetic force field. So there we are. Uh, what's a magnetic magnet and what is a compass? There we are. All right. So some say, some it has been said that the earth is a giant compass. In fact, that's a kind of declaration that scientists made about in the year 1600 when they first started understanding that the earth had a magnetic field and that kind of resembled a magnet. Um, and in fact, what they understood is if they took a magnet and carved it into a sphere and looked at the inclination um, as a function of position on that kind of spherical carved magnet, um, the inclination of the magnetic field, they saw that the inclination was like that of the earth. And on the basis of that kind of simple observation, they thought, well, that means that the earth is a magnet. It is in some sense, but it's not a simple bar magnet as shown in this particular diagram. Um, the uh, kind of notion that the Earth, Earth's magnetic field looks like a bar magnet is a useful, um, dis simple description. It's an incomplete description as I'm gonna discuss, but it is a useful description. Um, so for example, in towards the South uh, Geographic Pole, there is the South Magnetic Pole. And at the South Magnetic Pole, the field lines as shown in this diagram, um, exit the Earth, they diverge, they thread their way through space and they reconverge towards the North Magnetic Pole, um, Earth's, mag Earth's nor North Magnetic Pole, which is located near the geographic North Pole. All right, so that's an interesting description. It's incomplete because the Earth's magnetic field doesn't have that kind of tidy symmetry that a bar magnet would have. And furthermore, and this is something I'll discuss in some detail, the Earth's magnetic field is time dependent. It changes over time. And that is not a property that you would expect from a static bar magnet um, buried deep inside the Earth. And furthermore, the Earth's interior is very hot and, and hot material does not have that tidy organization of atoms that I was you know, describing in that description of what a magnetized material is. So we know that the Earth's interior does not have a, a bar magnet because the Earth is hot and the magnetic field of the Earth is time dependent in some very interesting ways. I'll discuss that now. Okay, so I just wanna briefly remind you of essentially the anatomy of the Earth beneath our feet and going downwards and we're standing on the crust of the Earth. Um, the plate tectonics, the mountains, the oceanic crust, the ocean, um, all of that is the surface of the earth. But beneath that is a rocky layer, a few thousand kilometers thick, known as the mantle. Um, and inside of that is a ball of liquid iron. All right, so deep down in the earth 
Um, the Earth's core is made out of liquid iron with a little bit of nickel mixed into it. And then inside of that is actually a solid iron inner core, all right? It's a very dynamic part of the Earth. And, and as I was suggesting in the first slide, that is the site of a naturally occurring electric generator, which I'll discuss. The Earth's interior is very hot. And as a result, there's no permanent ferromagnetic-like magnetism. And that's not possible, um, except within a few tens of kilometers of depth of the Earth. Because again, if you get too deep, it's too hot and permanent magnetization can't, can't be sustained. So we think that inside the Earth, it's not a permanent magnet, but there is a process, a process kind of like related to Faraday's law. Remember that? Time-dependent variations in the magnetic field induce electric fields and electric fields drive currents and currents generate magnetic fields. That's kind of the unification of, of Faraday's law and Ampere's law and Ohm's law. Um, those laws put together describe a dynamo. And we think that in, in the Earth's interior, there is a process by which convective motion, that is, it's in a sense mechanical because there are things moving in the Earth. The Earth's core is hot and it is, um, uh, moving in response to differential temperatures across its volume. Um, and that motion is facilitated by generating a magnetic field. It does that, though, um, in mm, kind of unison with the fact that the Earth, the Earth is also rotating. So the, the forces of rotation and forces related to the geomagnetic field themselves are kind of balanced in the Earth's core, and that ultimately describes the um, overall strength of the Earth's magnetic field, and it also explains why it is that the Earth's magnetic field is at least approximately aligned with the Earth's rotation, because rotation is an important factor there. So electric currents in the Earth's core, and they generate magnetic fields. All right. So I wanna talk now about mapping the Earth's magnetic field. And for that, I'm going to turn to a very famous scientist named Edmund Halley, a English astronomer who's best known for understanding the periodic orbit of the comet that bears his name. So he was a, an astronomer, um, I believe at Cambridge University in England, and um, was very famous for that understanding of the fact that comets have a periodic have periodic orbits and could predict the next arrival of the comet, like I say, that bears his name. Halley was more than an astronomer. He was also a mathematician, and I'm very happy to say he was also a geophysicist. And in 1698, Halley was given command of a Royal Navy ship known as the Paramore. This actually is the first time in in English history that a civilian was given command of a Royal Naval vessel. And for three years, the Paramore sailed around the Atlantic Ocean so that Halley could make measurements of the Earth's magnetic field. What he was doing was making measurements of declination, that is the deviation of the compass from true north. The compass doesn't point north almost everywhere, as I'll show you. Um, so he was measuring that deviation at different points around the Atlantic Ocean. and um, and then he took that data and um, analyzed it. This, this, this project of his was really what amounted to the, one of the first global scale surveys of the earth. And this is the early days in surveying and understanding that the earth is not just you know, interesting on a local scale, but on a very broad scale. It has um, a nature and as we'll see a behavior um, that occurs on a global scale. And this very um, oh, ambitious and um, creative project of Halley's um, really provided a, us with some interesting insight about the Earth's magnetic field on a global scale. So he took this data from his survey measurements around the Atlantic and he put together this map. It's a very beautiful map, as you might expect from that era, showing magnetic declination. Again, the deviation of the compass from true north. I'm going to discuss this in a little bit of detail. So here we have the Atlantic Ocean, and there's this dark line that kind of passes through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on this chart. That is the line of zero declination. On that line, the compass points north. Everywhere else, 
the compass does not point north. So that's why I like to say the compass um, doesn't point north almost everywhere. And that was a discovery that um, was uh, allowed by uh, um, Halley doing this survey and putting together this contour plot. I should also mention, this is one of the first contour plots in the history of the world. So again, another level of creativity that Halley brought to the subject. Okay, so we have a zero declination line. On that line, the compass points true north. And to the left and a little bit to the south of that line, what Halley has labeled here as east variation, that means that the compass is pointing to the east of true north. And above that zero declination line and to the right, and to the east, the uh, compass has west variation. That means that the compass tends to point towards the west. All right. So these are interesting and important charts, which were important for navigation, um, because in these days, Europeans especially were sailing around the world for purposes of, you know, colonization and evangelism. Um, and, uh, and in, in doing that, they needed to know where their ships were going and they used the compass for that. And it was important for them to therefore know how accurate the compass um, orientation was. And if they didn't happen to be on the line of zero declination, what the deviation of the compass was from true north. So they used that map plus the compass to uh, um, aid their navigation around the world. The other interesting thing, so, so with Halley uh, making a map like this, we know that the Earth's magnetic field has a shape, a shape that does not simply resemble a bar magnet. But we also know from making maps like this for different years, that that magnetic field also changes in time. It changes over historical time scales. And that means, it's a nuisance to navigators actually, that means that charts like this would need to be updated periodically in order to be useful for navigators. So that was another interesting discovery that Halley made. The Earth's magnetic field is not bar magnet-like, and in fact, it's time dependent. Okay. So this is a very nice movie put together by some of my colleagues, um, a whole lot of work has gone into this, basically taking data, including data from Halley, but also data from other um, explorers and other people who did subsequent surveying of the Earth's magnetic field, data, taking data from fixed stations, stations that we call magnetic observatories, and over, a mo over modern eras, taking data from satellites, measurements of the magnetic field from all those different sources, and putting it together to to construct a time-dependent map of the Earth's magnetic field from, I think this map goes from 1590 up to about the present time. So it's about 400 years in the evolution of the Earth's magnetic field. And you can see very, very clearly that the Earth's magnetic field is changing quite dramatically over that time scale. And just to emphasize that, these contour lines are lines of five degrees. So we have that dark line, which is the zero declination line, which I'm highlighting right here, going through the Americas and about the present time. Oh, okay, movie started all over again. There's the zero declination line. You might just watch its evolution as a function of time, changes over time. Um, the blue lines are lines of west variation. That means the compass is pointing to the west. And the red lines are lines of east variation, the compass is tending to point towards the east. And each of those, like I say, is a line of five degrees. Okay, five degrees is quite easy to me measure on a compass. But you also see that other um, uh, contour lines are five, 10, 20 degrees. Um, so the deviation of the compass from true north is not just you know noticeable, it's quite significant. Um, and it's even, gets even larger as you get closer to the geographic poles as, as shown in these uh, lower diagrams down here. All right, so a um, couple of other interesting observations. If you happen to be, uh, if you happen to have your compass and you are north of the north magnetic pole, your compass will point south not north, because <laughs> um, it's pointing um, in, in accordance with the local magnetic field, and that's tending to 
converge towards the North geomagnetic pole, which is not perfectly situated over the geographic pole. Just to emphasize that in this uh, polar diagram of the earth showing the evolution of the magnetic field over time in the near the north, north northern parts of the earth. Geographic pole is right in the center and the magnetic pole is that green dot. And you can see that that in fact moves around. And like I say, if you are north of that pole, your compass will point south. Um, there's also a south magnetic pole, which is shown over here. And, it, and similarly, if you are, let's see, south of the south magnetic pole, your, um, your, your compass, let's see, will also point uh, south. Um, so there's interesting um, shape to the magnetic field. And like I say, it's changing over time. And this is an important clue um, as to the source of the Earth's magnetic field. It's related to the fact that there is that fluid convection in the Earth's core. Um, that convection is generating a magnetic field. It just happens to be a magnetic field that is not steady. It's time dependent and um, always changing in kind of irregular ways. All right. We can come back to that, and if you have questions on that, that I'm happy to talk to you about that. All right, the other concept that I want to highlight is the discovery of geomagnetic polarity reversals. I think uh, some of you may have heard of that. I often get, get questions from um, the public about it. Um, and for this, I want to talk to you about a scientist named Bernard Brunus. He's a French geophysicist who worked at a geophysical observatory that was situated on top of a mountain in southern France called Puy de Dome. It's an extinct volcano in southern France. And his job was to operate a meteorological and a magnetic observatory um, on top of that mountain. Now, Bernard Brunus had colleagues um, who were interested in analyzing archeological pottery, all right? So his colleagues were analyzing pottery and they were very well aware that archeological sites around Europe um, um, provided them with pottery that interestingly was magnetized, it had a faint magnetization. And, and from that, so from that, um, Brunus knew that pottery after firing and cooling preserved a magnetization um, with a polarity like that of the earth. Okay, that's an interesting concept. Go back to the idea of a magnet and the organization of the atoms. If you take a, um, a piece of pottery with a little bit of iron in it, those iron atoms will align themselves with the earth's magnetic field. And as you lower the temperature of the pottery, let it cool, um, the alignment of those atoms will be preserved according to the magnetic field that, it, that the pottery felt while it was going through that cooling process. So Bernard Brunus took that very interesting observation and here he is situated on top of a volcano to do his work. Um, he went out into the field and took a sampling of a layer of clay that he knew had been overlaying with a lava flow, all right? So we figured, oh, that layer of clay was heated at one point with the emplacement of that lava. It must have been, must have been, you know, the temperature gone up and then it cooled down in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field at the time that the lava was cooling. All right. He took that sample back to his laboratory and measured it. And sure enough, that layer of clay was magnetized. <clears throat> but to his surprise, it was not magnetized like the present Earth's magnetic field. It had a polarity that was the opposite of the Earth's present magnetic field. All right, so he was kind of puzzled by that. And so what he did then was go back out to the field and measure the, take a sample from the lava flow itself. All right, took that back and measured it. And again, um, a polar, a magnet, the rock was magnetized but it was of reversed polarity. It had a polarity like that of the clay, but it was the opposite polarity um, compared to that of the present day Earth. Well, this was uh, an interesting set of observations. And I can tell you, this is a set of observations that came out of the blue. Um, if this kind of uh, discovery of this magnitude was made today, he would receive a Nobel Prize. 
Um, this is quite important. Um, reluctantly, Brunus concluded um, something he didn't quite ever anticipate, nor did anybody else, that at some time in the past, the Earth's magnetic field must have had a polarity that's opposite of the present polarity. All right, well, that's an interesting discovery. So, turns out if you measure rock in different places, rock of different ages, um, you can put together a record of the changing polarity of the Earth's magnetic field as a function of time. In particular, if you found yourself, and these exist, um, a very deep, temporally deep vertical stack of sedimentary and lava rocks, and you measured the magnetization of each one of those layers of rock, you would see some of them have what geophysicists call a normal polarity. That is a polarity which matches the present polarity of the Earth's magnetic field. And some of them would have a reversed polarity. So just schematically showing that here on the left-hand side, the most recent um, magnetic cron that we exist in, called, named after Bernard Brunus, um, is a normal cron. It uh, has a polarity like the Earth's magnetic field is today. Rock samples collected over the past, that have been in place for, um, sometime in the past 750,000 years, um, will have a polarity like that of the Earth's magnetic field that we have today. But if you go look at rocks that are a little bit older, you will find that they have the reverse polarity, okay? And, and so there's the Matayama reverse cron. If you go back further in time to about two and a half million years ago, again, the rocks become of normal polarity. Um, go back a little bit further, a little bit more than three million years, again, a reverse polarity. So we can see from records like the, uh, this and from older rocks, of course, that the Earth's magnetic field occasionally reverses its polarity. And it, furthermore, if you were to date those reversals of polarity, you would find that in many respects, reversals appear to occur randomly in time. Okay, well, that's an interesting observation. Remember, the Earth's magnetic field is time dependent over historical time scales, but it also over geologic time scales. It's not just time dependent, it reverses itself. On average, reversals occur about every million years, but like I say, it's kind of random. And a typical reversal takes about 10,000 years to occur. So that means about 1% of the time, the Earth's magnetic field is actually in the process of reversing. And we are. An important and interesting property of the Earth's magnetic field. All right, so I oftentimes get asked about why the Earth's magnetic field reverses its polarity. And I I'll just have to confess to you that there is not a tidy answer for a why question like that. The Earth's magnetic field reverses because that happens to be a property of the Earth's dynamo, all right? If we look around the solar system, there are other dynamos and other planets, other planets and the sun have magnetic fields. We know something about the sun's magnetic field and interestingly, it also reverses, but it doesn't do so randomly. It, it's almost, uh, almost a very tidy periodic reversing dynamo. In other words, it is reversing all the time and is basically oscillating. So that's a different kind of, of um, you might say a dynamical system in our solar system. The sun's magnetic, sun has a magnetic field and the magnetic field that it generates is oscillatory. The earth has a magnetic field and the magnetic field that it generates is randomly reversing. All right, so we know from theories of chaos, a, subject of, uh, of uh, mathematical dynamics, that there is something known as the butterfly effect. And this describes the time dependence of physical systems that are sensitive to initial conditions. All right, and I'll give some examples of that. Now, although the behavior of some systems, like the Earth's magnetic field, might be predictable over short periods of time, we also know that if there are slight mm, nudges, slight perturbations made to the dynamo, that the magnetic field of the earth would evolve in a different way over long periods of time. 
And those perturbations are um, something we uh, describe in analogy with the flapping of the butterfly's wings, which would be a very gentle perturbation. So that can disturb a dynamical system and make long-term predictions very difficult or impossible. It's worth dis um, uh, discussing a couple of simple examples. So on the left here, don't see this very much anymore because people don't smoke as much as they used to. But you, know, you, you can put a cigarette in an ashtray and just let it sit there. And sometimes it exhibits some really, the smoke exhibits some really interesting behavior. The smoke will rise up almost in a very gentle stream. And then all of a sudden, without much uh, explanation, kind of break up into a very complicated set of eddies um, as shown in that picture on the left. All right, so that is, if you like, a dynamical system. It's a cigarette, which is burning, and it's giving off some smoke. Now, if you were to just ever so gently touch that cigarette, the smoke would be disturbed, right? And, and even with the smallest touch of the cigarette, the smoke would be disturbed, and the pattern that the smoke has would not be the same as what it had before. And in fact, just by touching it, you wouldn't be able to predict exactly how the smoke would flow after touching that cigarette. That's an example of the butterfly effect. So you have a very gentle kind of nudge that you apply to that system and its subsequent behavior changes. Sometimes it even changes quite dramatically. Another example is the Earth's weather, right? We can predict the weather with some good accuracy for five or maybe 10 days in advance. But beyond that, predicting the weather next year, what's it going to be like a year from today, is not really possible. And that's because the weather is a function of the present day conditions. The future evolution of the Earth's weather is a function of the present day weather. And it is a function of all the little details in the weather system that is of the Earth. And if unless we understand all of those details with perfection, we can't make long-term predictions of the behavior of the weather. Again, another example of the butterfly effect. Well, the Earth's dynamo also is a chaotic system, and we think it exhibits kind of butterfly effect-like properties. Again, the Earth's magnetic field is time-dependent over historical times. It's kind of changing around the present polarity that it has, and occasionally also over geological times, it reverses its polarity. So I want to show another diagram here, which kind of takes that out and explains things a little bit metaphorically. I'm sorry, one of my kitties is trying to join us. Um, so next slide. All right, so this is a little movie which I pulled off of, of YouTube, which is, I'm going to show this a couple of times. It's not very long, but it is, if you like, a metaphorical description of the Earth's magnetic field and its chaotic time dependence. So what you see here is a line which is moving around. Um, it is a set of lines actually that are moving around and they're making this motion in accordance with physical laws which would describe the dynamics of the Earth's interior. Here, I'm gonna start this movie over. Go backwards here. Okay, so there we are early on in the evolution of this little movie. Um, you see the line trace is just starting out. And as you saw in the presentation just a few seconds ago, um, that line trace is going to, to essentially kind of orbit around two spots on the screen, all right? You could think of those two spots as the two polarities of the Earth's magnetic field, normal and reverse. Um, the Earth, is just as happy generating a magnetic field with the normal polarity like we have today or a reversed polarity like we had more than 750,000 years ago. It's just as happy doing either. And it's also time dependent. And so in that sense, the Earth's magnetic field is kind of orbiting for a while around one polarity. And then sometimes we'll orbit around the other polarity and then come back to the first polarity, all right? So I was talking also about the 
unpredictability of the Earth's magnetic field. So this little uh, stretch of, of line here is not actually one line, it's actually three. And as we'll see, I'll let it go here. Um, after a while, those three spots will diverge and you will see that they behave after a while and start to behave differently. So here we are orbiting around the other polarity, coming back to the first one there. You see the spots are, uh, are starting to diverge and orbiting around the other polarity now. Okay, we have blue, yellow, and, and green lines. And you'll see after a while here that they actually start to diverge. Um, now we have the yellow line going in a way that's not like the green line, it's not like the blue line, all right? Started off in pretty much exactly, almost exactly the same way, just ever so slightly different. But the subsequent evolution of this system is very different after a while, um, after the passage of time, it's sensitivity to those initial conditions. And in that sense, it's very hard to predict the Earth's magnetic field and its behavior and to understand why or understand when um, the Earth's magnetic field will reverse again. Um, and like I was saying, reversals appear to happen in a fairly uh, kind of random way. <clears throat> so there you go. The Earth's magnetic field is time dependent um, in a couple of different ways and some of which are exhibiting the property of chaos. All right, so that's the end of my little presentation. Folks, I thank you for uh, listening in and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, yeah, I, let me get my questions. Should I uh, remove the share or maybe I keep it on? I don't know. So Mike, should I look at the questions we have? We have a couple of questions here. Okay, so I'm not hearing Mike. Um, I'm hoping that you folks can hear me. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can you, hear you, you now. Can hear me now. Okay, that's because I had myself muted. It's like a- Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the dumbest thing to do on, on Zoom, but I did. <laughs> um, so we, we have we have questions here, and normally okay. I, I I read them at the end. Yeah. And um, first of all, I thought it was a very interesting um, presentation. I think that um, you showed a lot of things very clearly. Uh, the reversal of polarity and things. I think everybody's heard about that. You kind of explained the you know how it happens, why it happens, and what we don't know about it. And that was really interesting. So I have some, have a number of questions actually. So okay. um, the first is uh, what technology was available to Haley? on his expedition on the HMS uh, Paramore to okay. measure. So, so they had surveying instruments. Um, they would be surveying instruments that um, relied on orientation uh, with respect to the sun or with respect to the stars. Um, they were very good instruments. Um, you know, they had telescopes in those days. Um, and I just wanna emphasize, even in the 17th century, um, you know, they didn't have electronic systems, but they had very good mechanical systems. Just remember, they had clocks and watches that kept um, time pretty darn accurately. They had quite mm -hmm. precision mechanical instruments. Right. And so those instruments were available to them. Of course, they had compasses. Um, and they wouldn't, in those days for a survey, they would not have been using a tiny little handheld compass. They would have had a, a big compass. <laughs> Maybe the magnetic needle might've been a couple feet long. Um, and and be, because it's big, they can make accurate measurements um, uh, from such a, an instrument. So those are the kinds of instruments that they had in those days. They were very um, mechanical and the um, you know, people using the instruments were you know, very respectful of that um, process and uh, well-trained and they could make quite accurate measurements of the Earth's magnetic field, much um, more accurate than you need, needed to discover the time dependence of the magnetic field over the Atlantic, which you could see changes by, changes by 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees over periods of years. Wow. Okay, I have a question here from Nick and he asks, how often does the USGS update their maps for magnetic declination? 
Yeah, so it's the USGS doesn't um, isn't per se responsible for magnetic declination maps, um, although declination is oftentimes plotted on some of the maps. Um, but the US government does have a project for updating maps of the Earth's magnetic field, all the components, not just declination. And those are, are regularly updated every five years. Okay. A uh, question from <laughs> Teresa. Why is the Earth's core solid when it's surrounded by such a hot layer? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, this Earth's inner core is hotter than the outer core, um, and yet it's solid, and it's solid because of the pressure. Um, so there's more pressure the deeper you go in the Earth, and there's a phase transition um, as the result of that pressure, which um, gives you a solid inner core, which is essentially a giant kind of crystalline blob of, of iron and nickel. Would the, um, uh, just a question for me, would the, would the temperature of that then be really, really hot, but it was forced somehow to become a solid because yep. of other properties? Is that? Because of the, because of the pressure. Because of other forces. It's, it's just compressing it. And, you know, it says, uh -huh. you know, we're going to uh, organize those atoms and they're not going to be allowed to flow freely. They're going to be regularly organized like a solid. Okay. Then, okay. Then, I have another question. You just, uh, I just want to elaborate on some of these great questions. Um, so just uh, for your information, the Earth's core um, has a temperature of about, about 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's about 5,000 degrees centigrade. That's quite hot. Mm -hmm. um, it's hot. That's uh, almost as hot as the surface of the sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Here, here's another one. It says, when you say that the Earth reverses polarity, does that mean that our modern day compasses, compass would point south rather than north? And if not, what does reverse polarity mean? Yeah, so um, after the reversal is over, it means that the compass would, yes, point in the opposite direction. But the reversal itself takes a while to happen, you know, like about 10,000 years to happen. And I just wanna put a couple of those time scales into perspective. The last time we had a reversal was about 750,000 years ago. It's actually 780,000 years ago, but yes. A while ago. Um, just put that in perspective. 780,000 years ago, Homo sapien did not exist. All right. Um, there were other humanoids, but not Homo sapien. Um, so that was a long time ago. And put 10,000 years into perspective, 10,000 years ago, civilization didn't exist. Um, so these are quite long time scales. And, and, you know, it's true. If we had a reversal, um, after a while, the compass would point in the opposite direction, but it would be quite a while. And over that period of time, who knows what civilization would be doing. And I don't know if they would have compasses, but uh, um, they would have some way of dealing with it. Let's put it that way. You know, it looked from, um, from the map that um, the way that we here in the U.S. say use a compass um, wouldn't be possible in some of the, like Iceland or, or, or the Faroe Islands or, you know, or, or Norway, or those nor northern places, because the, the compass is not going to point um, north at all. I mean, is that, it's going to maybe point more to the west or the east. That's right. That, well, that's um, so you can still use the compass. You just need to know which direction it wants to point. Um, sure. Okay. And, and so that's why you would need a, a map or a, a model, as scientists call them, um, a map of the Earth's declination. And if you know that declination, the deviation from true north, then you just would compensate for that. If it's five degrees, you compensate. If it's 50 degrees, you compensate. Okay, let's see. Uh, Betsy says, very interesting presentation. Um, Janet says, will this, will this and tomorrow's presentation be on YouTube or another place so we may, may watch a second time? Um, we, we usually leave that uh, to f first to the presenter, you know, if, if the presenter wants to do that. And we can, uh, yeah, I'll talk with Jeffrey about that later. Um, and if that's okay, then we do. And um, sometimes though, uh, presenters uh, don't want to do it for, for different reasons. It just, it just um, it changes. Uh, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind. And so that okay. means I probably will be there. Yeah. Okay. That's right. We. I will then. So you um, really take a day. I just want to say that everything I'm talking about has been published. Um, so there's right, right. nothing new here and nothing kind right, of juicy right. and controversial. So. Right. Okay. Uh, so yes. 
um, probably within a couple of days, I would say. You can, mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll post it on our website. Uh, uh, or actually, I have the list of everyone who was in the in the, the uh, program tonight, so I could just send out an email. Okay, so Richard says, um, what are the things that would be perceivable to humans when the Earth's polarity shifts? Mm -hmm. Does it disrupt things or is it not perceivable? Well, it's perceivable, you know, um, not through your senses um, of your body, but it's perceivable through our devices like compasses or uh, magnetometers. Um, so in that sense, it's, you know, measurable. Um, but like I say, the... You know, if when we look at the history of the geomagnetic polarity reversals, which was a long time ago, the last one happened, um, so I wouldn't get too worried about it you know, in the near future. Um, does it disrupt things? Well, like I say, if it takes 10,000 years to happen, and if we just imagine, you know, 10,000 years in the future, um, it's hard to imagine that, but uh, I don't think that they will, 10,000 years in the future, they'll have any problem they'll just deal with it they'll, the charts might look a little bit weird um, if they're making them um, if they're using the compass they'll compensate for the declination just like they do today okay and a second question here from richard he says does it affect bacteria or fungi or similar creatures more than bigger creatures such mm -hmm. as humans so so there is a subject of of uh, science that is concerned with how it is that some species of animals are actually affected by um, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, so some of you might know that uh, sea turtles use the Earth's magnetic field for navigation. Um, it's not the only thing they use. They also, I think they also use smell, for example. Um, um, and I just want to be clear, I'm not an expert on sea turtles, but um, uh, mm -hmm. Sea turtles uh, do have kind of some ha some sort of internal compass that is at least um, giving them some uh, sense of the direction that they are swimming. Um, it's interesting. Uh, sea turtles have really long life lifespans, and since the Earth's magnetic field changes, presumably the sea turtle is learning to accommodate that. Um, other things, bacteria. Yeah, there's a. a, a species of, it might be more than one species, but there's a type of, of uh, bacteria that um, actually uses the Earth's magnetic field for navigating. They have tiny little magnets inside their bodies. Um, and uh, because bacteria are tiny, um, if the magnet uh, reorients itself in response to the Earth's magnetic field, the bacteria just is reoriented. So the bacteria use that for essentially knowing which way is up and down, because, um, you know, they, they're pretty primitive, uh, pretty primitive uh, um, animals, and um, they need to know where the food is, and the food is either up or down, um, I guess, depending on which kind of bacteria you are, and if you have a 50% chance of getting that right, um, either swimming up or down, um, that's better than swimming horizontally, or you might not get the food, so in that respect, bacteria use the magnetic field for orientation, yes. It's, okay, it's so I have a question. Fun here. subject, but it's not something I work on. <laughs> okay, you're right. Uh, so I have a question here from Emily who says, I've heard that the Earth's magnetic poles are moving more quickly than they have in the past. Is that true? And what does that mean for potential reverse in polarity in the near future? Right, so um, yeah, right. Over the past few decades, the North Magnetic Pole has actually been accelerating away from northern Canada towards Siberia. Um, I don't think that that's anything particularly weird. Um, um, it just happens to be the way the Earth's magnetic field is changing at the moment. Um, and, and just because, you know, it's changing that way, I would not say that that means we are imminently going to have a reversal. Um, Kind of the metaphor I like to use is predicting the next reversal of the Earth's magnetic field is like predicting the next bull run on the stock market. Um, you don't know it's happening until it's yeah. half over. All right. <laughs> um, so in that sense, uh, um, I uh, I don't I'm not putting any money on uh, the Earth's magnetic field reversing in the next you know few thousand years. Okay. Let's see. Teresa says, looking forward to part two. 
Uh, Betsy well. says, <laughs> does the slight continual process of reversing the magnetic field affect us today? And if so, how? Yeah, I, you know, I don't think it has a, a direct effect on us. Um, uh, the reversing of the Earth's magnetic field is not affecting us today, um, other than it provides us with a uh, provides geologists with a convenient way of, of, of kind of correlating different uh, rock formations. Um, and it provides us with some scientific insight as to the behavior of the Earth's magnetic field, but it doesn't have a direct effect on, on human beings, the reversal, not at the moment. Okay, okay. Uh, Judith asked, how is the Earth's core temperature measured? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, God, um, I'm sure there's a lot of kind of semi-independent ways, um, you know, so one, one way you would um, estimate the temperature of the core is getting back to the inner core um, and understanding, you know, how hot iron needs to be in order to solidify or conversely to melt um, at the pressures that the earth has in its very deep interior. So we know the earth has an inner core it has an outer core, mostly from seismology, frankly. Seismic waves pass through the Earth, and they, the different properties of the Earth, be it liquid or solid, affect the propagation of seismic waves. Um, and we know the mass of the Earth, so we have a pretty good estimate of the pressure that exists at the inner core, outer core boundary, and from that, um, an understanding about how hot it needs to be in order to melt at that boundary um, gives us an estimate of the temperature. Okay, let's see. If the Earth's core is 9,000 degrees and similar to the sun, could it have broken from the sun at one time? Uh, no. Um, no, the Earth uh, did not break from the sun in the past. Um, the sun and the Earth and the other planets formed um, you know, 4.6 billion years ago all at the same time from a vast collection of dust and gas. Um, you know, the sun has is the center of mass of the solar system. It's quite large and it has a strong gravitational field. And even though it's hot, it can hold on to the tenuous gases that form most of its, um, most of its composition. The Earth's magnetic, the Earth is, is, is a much smaller gravitational field. Um, it just holds on to the heavier elements better. The lighter elements probably got uh, kind of eroded by, the sun and the early evolution of the of the solar system, um, but the Earth was never part of the sun at any point. Yeah. In the okay, uh, is the change in the declination line movement shown in the simulation a result of polarity reversing? Um, uh, I I would not say yes or no to that question. The Earth's magnetic field changes over. A variety of time scales, and that is all a property of the Earth's dynamo. Um, so the time dependence that you see over historical time is related to the core, as is the reversal of the core. And you know, I showed that uh, diagram of what we call a strange attractor, that line floating around mm -hmm. two different mm -hmm. points. Um, that orbiting around one particular point is in kind of metaphor like the variation over historical times. And when it orbits around one point as opposed to the other point, that's like the reversal. And in that sense, you can't really um, cut it up into two parts. It's all part of one thing. Okay. Let's see, Sanjeev asked, is the declination built into the to GPS devices like my phone's apps? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, GPS is, uh, uh, technology that uses satellites and radio signals from satellites to determine location, okay? Location is location, whereas the compass tells you orientation. So which direction you're, you're pointing. So that's different than um, GPS. Having said that, uh, many GPS systems, GPS readers, and in fact, your cell phone, which also has GPS, also has a little model of the Earth's magnetic field, your Cell phone um, also has a small magnetometer in it, which acts like a compass. And so orientation um, in your cell phone, orientation in many GPS systems, not all of them, but many of them, is based on measuring the Earth's magnetic field using a built-in map, um, electronic 
electronically described, but a map inside the electronics of those devices to then tell you the direction or heading um, that's different than the location provided by GPS. Okay. Uh, let me see. We still have more questions. We got a lot of questions. A lot of good I'm, questions. I'm happy to take them all. <laughs> okay. Um, this, that's, yeah. Um, I lost my place. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, question from Betsy again. It says, when the line of zero declination intersects land, does the compass point to true north? Or does that happen only over the oceans? If you uh, if you are on a line of zero declination, the compass points north. If you are over the ocean or over land. Okay. Uh, Sanjeev says, "Meaning, um, uh, I'm not quite sure I understand." It says, "Meaning, comp meaning, compensation." What's, what's meaning and compensation. Yeah. Um, so, if you have a chart that tells you the deviation of the compass from true north. And then you look at your location on that chart, on that map, and you take your compass and measure the direction of the compass needle, then you know how much you have to adjust off of the direction of the compass needle to find true north. And that's what I mean by compensation. Okay. Uh, okay, we have, does the reversal happen over a short period of time with long periods of stability in between, or is it a continual slow process? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a continual slow process like I was showing in that squiggly diagram. Um, um, and so when I say the reversal happens like over time scale of 10,000 years, that's a kind of a very general um, kind of crude description because really the magnetic field is not binary. It's not pointing north or south. It is changing all the time. And like I say, that changing over historical time scales and over geological time scales all related to the same thing, what's going on in the Earth's interior. Okay. Let's see. Nick says, does Abna have a YouTube channel? <laughs> well, I, yeah. <laughs> so actually, we kind of do, but it's in the very, very early stages, okay? Mm -hmm. We don't have very much um, that is on there, but we do have a few things on there. And, um, you know, the whole thing with webinars really it maybe got started here within the last year. And so um, kind of haphazardly things have been added to it, but it's not really been addressed as like a proper YouTube channel. So there are things there, but we've got work to do. Okay, Janet says, are the magnetic declinations different at different heights above the surface of yeah, the Earth? Another great question. Thanks, Janet. And the answer is yes. Um, the Earth's magnetic field, like I showed in that first cartoon in the first slide of my presentation, um, you know, the field lines diverge from the south and converge to the north. Um, usually when we're talking about declination, we mean at the surface of the Earth, but if you were to take your compass and be in an airplane or in, on the space station or anything, you're going to get a deviation of tr from true north in some respect, um, almost everywhere. Um, so it'll be different and it won't be the same um, as the location immediately underneath, you know, whatever, wherever you are above the Earth's surface. Um, having said that, the the difference will be quite small, actually, um, from say zero altitude up to even the height of the space station. Okay, uh, Robert says, uh, when in the development of the Earth did the the core form? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I can't put a number on it. Um, it was fairly early. Um, you know, we know that the Earth has had a magnetic field for. I believe at least 3 billion years. Um, and so that means that there's been a dynamo going on for at least 3 billion years. I don't know what was going on before then, and I'm not sure we have a clear answer on that, but that's a long time. Okay, and then I have one final question here from Richard. He says, has the Earth's magnetic field affected climate change and the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere? Um, I'm going to give you a short answer to that, and the answer is no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our um, questions. Uh, I think it was an excellent presentation. I think if somebody bumps into me tomorrow and they say, hey, what do you think of that declination? I'll, I'll have a lot more to say than I did before I watch your program. It's very informative. So, so Mike, I'll just want to um, just give a little pitch here and invite everybody to come tomorrow. I'm going to talk about magnetic storms. Um, 
and uh, the interaction of the Earth's magnetic field with the solar wind and how that affects uh, power grids on the surface of the Earth, which is something I do work on, and um, it's an issue of, of economic and national security. Okay, that sounds interesting. We'll be there. All right, with that, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone, and we'll see you uh, tomorrow night at 6.30. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you. Bye-bye.